Welcome to the Clutch Kitten Gaming Podcast, where I play an indie game for five hours and let you know whether or not it's worth your time and money. Hello and welcome everyone. This is James, also known as Clutch Kitten, and I am so excited that you're here for episode 50 of the show. Because I know I probably sound like a broken record week after week, I'm going to forego talking about podcast reviews and questions this time around so that we can jump straight into news. I feel like nowadays, news is either about Nintendo Switch or about the Epic Games Store. Luckily for you, this week we get to discuss a little bit of both. In the Switch news, now through September 15th, GameStop is running a sweet trade-in offer for your old Switch. They're offering $225 for a Switch trade-in, and what makes this enticing is the fact that the updated Switch model is now out. The way this all maths out to be is that it will cost you $75 to get a brand new Switch with better battery life and a slightly cooler running processor. Paying $75 just for a better battery life isn't necessarily the most enticing given the hassle of doing a trade-in, but what makes me interested is the added benefit of getting a brand new Switch. I'm still not sure if I'll do it yet, but if you've had your Switch for a while now, it's not a bad way to upgrade without having to spend a fortune. In the Epic Games Store news front, a few updates have been added to the client. As you're probably well aware, Epic's client is still pretty bare bones, and although these updates aren't bringing it in line with Steam, feature-wise at least, they're definitely a step in the right direction. The first update is added cloud saves for at least some games, including Darksiders 3, Hyperlight Drifter, Moonlighter, and about 14 others outside of the Ubisoft games, which already had that feature through the Uplay integration. What's interesting is that Epic actually addressed the fact that cloud saves aren't available for all games on the platform yet. What they said is, we're working with the developers of other released games to test cloud saves and will be enabling more games over time. Upcoming games that support cloud saves will have them enabled at launch. It's kind of annoying that this still isn't a feature for all games, but it still is good to know that it's in the works. The second update is added Humble Bundle Keyless Integration. Say that 10 times fast, oh my word. Basically, if you're a Humble Bundle subscriber, you can just link your Epic account and won't have to deal with entering all those keys for the games that you get. This isn't anything crazy, but it's definitely a quality of life update. The last update they mentioned in this article is a product page, quote unquote, facelift. I still haven't checked through to see this change myself, but apparently there are beefier game descriptions, better release date visibility, and a bunch of other added details. Again, whether or not you love or hate Epic, I do think that the better their store gets, the better it will be for everyone. It will be a smoother experience for Epic users, and it will hopefully cause Valve to get off their ass and do more work to Steam. Let's move on now to this week's game. Today's game is called 60 Seconds re and it's a dark comedy atomic adventure developed by Robot Gentleman. A quick thing to note is that if this game sounds familiar to you, it's because the original 60 Seconds was released in 2015. The reason I'm even looking at this game is actually because it has been re which is just a fancy, post-apocalyptic way of saying remastered. I never played the original, but according to what I've read and seen from screenshots and video, this remaster not only improves some of the graphics and art, it also adds a couple new modes. The studio Robot Gentleman was started back in 2012 in Poznan, Poland by Dominik Goroyuk, who at the time was a AAA developer, and Julius (laughs) Zenkner, oh my, who was a professional filmmaker, and what's cool is seeing how those backgrounds really influence the flow of this game. 
60 Seconds was their debut title, and due to its success, they made a spacebound sequel called 60 Parsecs, in addition to another game called Stray. Although 60 Seconds came out in 2015, 60 Seconds Reatomized just recently came out for PC on July 25th of 2019. Although this edition is still only out for PC, I would not be surprised if the remaster comes to pretty much everything else. For anyone who doesn't own the original, Reatomized costs $10 or $9.99, but the cool thing is that if you already own the base game, you get the update for free. According to HowLongToBeat.com, 60 seconds takes anywhere from 2 hours to 4 hours to beat, depending on the amount of content that you want to see. And although Reatomized adds a couple new modes, I doubt that the time to beat is really much longer. The modes are essentially broken up versions of the main mode, so once you've played the main mode enough, you've pretty much played all the modes that you would want. In terms of controls, you can use whatever the hell you want, and you should be fine. As we'll get more into soon, a majority of the game is essentially a survival visual novel, so as long as you have a way to click or press a button, you'll be able to play. Let's move on now to the narrative. It is another fantastic day at home. My son Timmy is somehow yelling at his alter ego for beating himself at checkers. My daughter Mary Jane is playing a god-awful rendition of Beethoven's Fifth on her tuba. And my wife Dolores is in the bathroom thinking that no one knows she's feeding her nicotine addiction by smoking a quick cigarette. Well, thank God for me, Ted. Yeah, that's me. I'm Ted. Thank God for me that we live in the future. This is the heyday of life. The 1950s. The star-studded... Oh, fuck. The nuclear alarm is going off, meaning that we only have one minute to grab all of our shit and get to the shelter. You know that Nuketown map from Call of Duty? Or the beginning of Fallout 4 where you're happily strolling around your home? That's pretty much the exact setting for 60 Seconds Reatomized. You're in 1950s suburbia, and everything has a retro hue to it. From the radio, to the gas mask, to the clothes that your characters wear. 60 Seconds is very unique in the sense that the game takes place in two phases. The first phase is a chaotic 60 seconds where you have to grab all the crap that you can from your house, including or not including your family. This part of the game has no narrative quality to it, however, it does significantly affect how the story will develop over the second phase of the game. I call it the second phase, but in reality it's pretty much the entirety of the game apart from those first 60 seconds. In the second phase, you and whoever else you manage to take with you are in the bunker, and this is the part of the game that's all about the choices you make with the resources you have. You go from day to day, writing in your journal about new events, rationing soup and water, trying to maintain the health of your family, and overall, you're just trying to find a way to survive. This is where the story starts to develop. One interesting thing is that when you first go into the bunker, your family is actually presented in a blank slate sort of way. This allows you as the player to take the role of the family and shape them exactly how you're wanting to. For example, one day I was presented with a character-shaping dilemma. In the craziness of running to the bunker, Mary Jane's tuba was unfortunately left behind. Because she has some sort of emotional connection to that giant piece of trash, I mean brass, she asks if she can go try to find it. Being the caring and loving father that I am, I told her no. I mean, imagine all the radiation poisoning and annoying instruments she could come back with. Well, it turns out that the next day, and pretty much from then on, she started going crazy because I didn't allow her to get the tuba. Making choices like that is where the game is really fleshed out. And what's interesting is that many of the choices have both gameplay and narrative implications. Let's say that someone knocks on your bunker door asking for water. On one hand, there are some real gameplay implications. Your stash of water will dwindle, 
and there may or may not be consequences depending on who the person is. On the other hand, you are also making a choice that shapes what your characters are like. It's a moral choice. Are your characters merciful, gullible, ruthless, cruel, or something else entirely? Nearly every choice you make shapes who your characters are, even if it's in a minute way. There are clearly a lot of ways to roleplay as this mid-century family, but you might be wondering, what does the end game look like? Is there a way to win this game? I won't spoil what the endings are, but there are numerous different outcomes based on those incremental choices you make. Are you going to help a wacky scientist? Are you going to meet up with the military? Is there some sort of weird thing going on with the stray cat named Sherikov that showed up at your door? As you progress through your time in the bunker, new narrative threads will reveal themselves, and depending on what tools you have available, you'll be able to follow some of those to completion. When it comes to the writing itself, Robot Gentlemen set up a fun, lighthearted tone in an otherwise doomed situation. Most of the scenarios were interesting to read through, and there's a nice mixture of both basic and complex decisions to make. The one complaint I'll bring up is that the more I played, the more repeat scenarios seemed to creep into my runs. There's a good and bad side to this, of course. The positive side is that those repeats allow you to experiment and find out what different choices will do. On the negative side, there are only two options for most of the choices you get, so there's a pretty big drop-off in enjoyment after you see a scenario for a second time. Let's move on now to the gameplay. So we've talked about how heavily the narrative factors into the game, but how does it feel to play? Let's start with the 60 second phase. What I appreciate about this section is that it gives you the feeling of being frantic. There's an alarm going off, you see a clock ticking in the corner, and you're trying to figure out where the hell everything is. Seems like a pretty accurate simulation of what an actual atomic bomb scenario would be like for most people. My appreciation of this phase stops there though because, apart from that, this section feels like sh** to play. The camera takes a weird isometric view, the animations are just bad, your character is awkward to control, and there is no good indication of how much room items will take in your inventory. The silver lining though is that this section is only 60 seconds, and I assume the devs over at Robot Gentleman were thinking that exact same thing. The rest of this game is essentially just a picture book, so why the hell would they want to spend a ton of time and resources refining the 60 second 3D portion of the game? Great point, that would be a waste. I just want to make it clear though, the 60 second portion of this game is by far the worst part of the experience. So how about phase 2? Well the weird thing is that there really aren't any systems to discuss. Your enjoyment of phase 2, and essentially the whole game, hinges almost entirely on whether or not you enjoy the writing and the world building. Gameplay wise, all you do in phase 2 is make decisions. You're deciding on who should get food and water, who to send out on scouting missions, and what to do when weird events take place. That's it. In terms of gameplay, the last things I'll mention are the two other game modes apart from the tutorial. There's a scavenge mode, which is literally just the 60 seconds part. This mode is only really helpful if you want to practice with the janky controls. Other than that, avoid it like the plague. The other mode is called survival mode, and it might actually be better than the normal apocalypse mode. In that mode, the game does the scavenging for you, so you start out in the bunker with whatever was found. Even though both modes are just slight variations on the base game, it still is a nice little bonus that they're available. Let's move on now to talk about the art and sound design. For reasons aforementioned, let's specifically talk about the art in the second phase of the game. Instead of sticking with those god-awful 3D visuals, Robot Gentleman transitions the art in phase 2 to a 2D, more graphic novel style. I'm a much bigger fan of what they did here. I'm not sure if you had this experience as a kid, but whenever I went to the doctor's office, there were these highlights magazines that were for kids. Inside, they always seemed to have those 
find a difference activities, which is one of those things when you compare two nearly identical pictures to find the differences. The art in 60 Seconds Reatomized reminded me a lot of those activities because each day there are subtle changes within the bunker. On day one, things are pretty good, but day by day, you start to notice little changes. There start to be spilled cans of tomato soup, Ted's beard starts to grow out, bugs start to appear on the floor, and so on. What's even better is that your day-to-day -day decisions affect how the bunker will look next. If you send Timmy out to explore the wasteland, his chair will be empty the next day. If you tell Mary Jane that she can't get her tuba, the next day her eyes and hair will start looking crazy. If you don't take care of that bug infestation, Dolores might turn green due to getting sick. The art is so simple and subtle, yet it's wonderfully effective. In regards to the soundtrack, I liked the songs, there just weren't enough of them. It felt like the same two songs were on a loop, and they began to get repetitive. I did, however, like what was being done with the sound effects. Most items in the bunker are able to be clicked on to produce a sound. Click on Sherikov and you get a few different cat meows. Click on the cards and you'll hear them be shuffled. This small design choice added an unnecessary but fun distraction. My wife and I played most of 60 seconds together, and it was nice for me to be able to click around the screen if she ever needed a few more seconds to read the text. It's one of those things that I wouldn't have missed if it was gone, but the fact that it was there provided some nice padding to the experience. Now that we've made it through the narrative, gameplay, art and sound design, let's summarize with some positives and negatives. First off on the positive side, the writing was creative, witty, and set an enjoyable tone for the entire experience. Second, it was fun experimenting with different choices and items to see what kind of outcomes could be produced. Should you send Timmy into the wasteland with a set of checkers or an axe? I'm not sure. Try one and find out. Third, I really enjoyed the art and the way it constantly was evolving as the days progressed. There were times where I would make a decision and I would be shocked at the way things looked the next day as a result. Seeing the screen fade to black and then back in with a few differences was a surprisingly engaging experience. First off on the negative side, the scenarios started getting repetitive. There were a whole lot of creative interactions written, but seeing repetition on my second playthrough was a bit disheartening. Second, the first phase nearly kept me from playing this game altogether. It looked and played terribly. I understand why the developers didn't spend a lot of time refining that experience, but I honestly would have preferred the 2D graphic style of art and gameplay for that phase as well. Third, I would have liked some additional music. I was already feeling like the game was repetitive due to seeing the same scenarios time and time again, so the repetition of music just added to that feeling. We've made it now to the final boss. This is the part of the podcast where I let you know whether you should slay the game and buy it, flee the game and avoid it, or farm up and wait for a sale. My verdict for 60 seconds re-atomized is to farm up and wait for that sale. This is a tough decision because there are some standout parts of the game that help to overshadow the negatives, but what pushed me over the edge was the fact that even the standout parts wore down in value relatively quick. My recommendation would be to grab this up in the next sale, mix up a couple cocktails, and play it with a friend or significant other. It won't be your go-to game for the next year, but I wouldn't be surprised if it provided you with a fun night or two of entertainment. As always, thank you all so much for taking the time to listen in. If you want to support the show, go tell a friend about it and make sure you subscribe on whatever podcast app you use. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you in-game. <laughs>